please queue up. Thank you. a lack of accountability, fines not being enforced. She, she used the term weak to describe uh, the, your ministry in terms of enforcement. What do you make of that criticism and, and are you going to improve things? So let me get to that right after I uh, deliver my remarks. So thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. So I am here today to speak to the Auditor General's report on pandemic response and readiness in long-term care. And I want to begin by thanking the Auditor General for her report. I had the opportunity to speak uh, at length with the Auditor General on Monday evening for a, a couple hours and uh, it was a very good discussion and uh, I certainly appreciated her time and her insights. So what happened in long-term care homes during this pandemic was decades in the making and after years of neglect and underfunding of this sector. And from the earliest stages, through the latest wave of COVID-19, our government has taken extensive and ongoing measures to protect the health, safety and well-being of long-term care residents, staff and their families. And the Auditor General's recommendations will inform the work that is already underway to modernize and improve Ontario's long-term care sector. We are investing up to 40, up to $4.9 million, billion dollars, $4.9 billion dollars over four years to create more than 27,000 new positions for personal support workers, registered nurses, and registered practical nurses in long-term care. This is going to allow us to deliver on our commitment to increase the hours of daily direct care to an average of four hours per day for each long-term care resident. This is an ambitious commitment and it will make Ontario the leader in Canada. And we are continuing to act with a sense of urgency. We are investing over $121 million to support the accelerated training of 8,200 personal support workers at Ontario's publicly assisted colleges. And this morning I joined my colleague, Minister uh, Romano, to announce almost $86 million for a one-time bursary program to provide financial support to PSW students at private career colleges and district school boards. And this investment will support the training of an additional 8,000 PSWs. This is in addition to over 8,600 new staff hired through the pandemic pay earlier. The previous government took seven years to build just 611 beds across the province. We are building 30,000. 30,000 safe, modern, comfortable spaces for our seniors to call home. And we are investing $2.6 billion to make good on our commitment to repair and rebuild capacity in long-term care. We have over 20,000 new and over 15,000 upgraded spaces in development. More than 60% of our goal of creating 30,000 new spaces in a decade. Long overdue. Over the next four years, we are also investing $246 million to improve living conditions in existing homes, including ensuring homes have air conditioning so our loved ones can live in comfort and with safety, dignity and respect. To ensure the ongoing safety of our residents, we continue to use inspections that prioritize complaints and critical incidents that pose risks to residents, allowing inspectors to respond more quickly. And uh, coming from a backlog under the previous government of 8,500 critical incidents and complaints, um, the efforts that were made by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care in 2018 uh, to address the inspections process is something that our Ministry of Long-Term Care uh, inherited and, uh, and understanding the importance of addressing a backlog of 8,500 critical incidents and complaints is necessary. We have heard what the Auditor General has said in this area and are in the process of developing a plan to make inspections even more effective and resident-centred. Our government is fixing a broken system. We have invested $9.6 billion into making long-term care a better place for residents to live and a better place for staff to work. And I would like to thank the Auditor General for her recommendations and her insights 
and we will review them carefully as part of our ongoing pandemic response. So thank you. So in terms of getting to your question, uh, in terms of the responses, the response by long-term care to the pandemic was an integrated response with the overall health care system. The long-term care system and our ministry, uh, we don't operate in a vacuum. Um, it was an integrated approach with uh, public health. Uh, the chief medical officers of health, the uh, associate uh, chief medical officer of health, the acute care sector. Um, it is an integrated approach and, and multi-ministries. So in terms of our response, um, you, you heard the uh, Auditor General mention, you know, it was essentially hospital focused initially. That was her, her insight. Uh, and to say that uh, long-term care needs to be uh, more integrated with public health uh, in inspectors, public health actions, yeah, you heard her say that as well. Uh, and in terms of our acute care sector, understanding how uh, those go hand in hand when long-term care works well, uh, the acute care sector will work uh, well. And so they need to be um, good partners and uh, certainly we've relied on the acute care sector um, in, in the, uh, over the last year to assist uh, long-term care and uh, we certainly appreciate everything that they have done uh, to support uh, the long-term care sector as well as our medical officers of health, our public health uh, groups. But this is, um, this is an unknown virus initially and the scientists are still disputing um, certain aspects of transmission including aerosol spread. So you can see that there's unfinished um, scientific evolution here. Minister, I'm hearing your response, you, you know, you're, you're casting a lot of blame on the previous governments mm -hmm. for not doing enough yeah. here. Um, but, you know, obviously the report highlights actions that this government could have taken. And I'm wondering, frankly, you know, does the buck not stop with you as minister here in terms of the inspections, in terms of the staffing situation? You know, like, doesn't the government bear some of the responsibility in this? Well, absolutely. You know, I, I spent my, my almost 30 years as a family doctor and 15 years researching long-term care. It's why I came to, to politics. Um, I don't think anyone anticipated a, a pandemic that would be global, aerosol spread, um, potentially a, a predominant mode of transmission. And in the early days, the understanding of how the tr transmission occurred was, was not fully understood, uh, as well as the asymptomatic spread. So we're dealing with a new virus uh, globally that has impacted uh, countries around the world, including long-term care homes around the world. So as, a, as someone who was trying to get here to solve the long-term care issues, it's why I came uh, professionally and from personal experience with family members, and then uh, to you know to be hit by the structural inadequacies, uh, not only in staffing and everything comes back to, to staffing, the structural inadequacies, the crowded homes, the 1970s homes, the the promises from the previous government to to uh, rebuild and redevelop 35,000 spaces, which never happened, the 2008 r uh, report that they had on staffing that they never they never acted on. Um, you know, the, 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 the 8,500 and more um, critical incidents and, um, and complaints that they, they let build up. And then walking in, knowing that we have capacity issues, hitting the ground running as soon as we became a ministry, addressing Justice Scalise report, uh, addressing issues within the home, getting a staffing strategy going, get, finding out why there weren't more homes built. And we did that in months. And then the pandemic hit. So... We were a standalone ministry created to focus on long-term care following the, the commitment by our government to build 15,000 beds in, in five years and create capacity that had been so sorely neglected. So the responsibility, it's, it's kind of like running into a building, a burning building. You know, you're trying to save it and you're doing your very best. Um, but the, you know, the fire had started well beyond the pandemic. And so I think it's our government that is a government that is committed to this. And, uh, you know, as I said, almost $10 billion just really committed in the last year to this. Something that could have been addressed. Everyone knew it was an aging population. It's no surprise. We've known that for decades. And so, you know, here we are with a global pandemic. We have no vaccines. Our PPEs in short supply. The, the, the testing reagents can't be found. It's a global competition. 
And so everyone, including public health, including the hospitals um, and personal support workers, our front line, everybody working round the clock, including thousands and thousands of people in the Ontario Public Service, trying to address this, this uh, global pandemic. So do I accept responsibility for, for all of that? Uh, I'm not a public health expert. Uh, I, I'm here to try and fix long-term care. Uh, but if the building's on fire and you're running into it to, to try and save people, yeah, I think that's pretty much what we tried to do. But we didn't start the fire. Let's go to the phones. A reminder to press star one if you have a question. First it will be Mike Crawley at CBC News. Um, so, Minister, just to follow up, what exactly do you take responsibility for? Well, absolutely. So as the Minister of Long-Term Care, I have uh, a responsibility, a duty, an obligation, and I've used those words here to residents in long-term care, to, to the staff in long-term care, even though that's primarily done through the Ministry of Health. Um, but, uh, I, but in terms of uh, re really raising the importance of long-term care and addressing the shortcomings, addressing the, the failures of the previous government, yes, I, I'm doing that. And that's, that's seen in our, our monumental commitment to the, the four hours of care. There's report after report after report, Mike, talking about the four hours of care, talking about the importance of doing that, and reports littering everywhere. It, it, was, it was plain to see. Why didn't the previous government act on that? I don't know. They had other priorities, obviously. But our government is committed to doing that. And the 1970s homes, we got 78,000 people in long-term care. You, you can't build overnight. And the staffing crisis that was preceding long -term, uh, the, the pandemic was, was years in the making. There was ample runway for the pre previous government to address all of those things. And the facts speak for themselves. 611 beds, that's it, that's all, between 2011 and 2018. We're committed to building 30,000 and are well underway. But you can't change things overnight. And you, you heard the, the Auditor General talk about the long-standing issues. And she's absolutely right. Staffing, uh, the, the, uh, the capacity problems, the crowding problems. In terms of the inspections, again, 8, 000, over 8,500 critical incidents and complaints that weren't addressed under the previous government. It was our government that came in and said, look, you can't have 8,500 critical incidents and, and complaints just dismissed. We have to deal with those. And we took the Auditor General's advice in terms of the, um, you know, looking at the uh, risk-based approach. And, and certainly that having recently been done by the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care just in 2018, we began our work as a new ministry uh, of long-term care, a standalone ministry, the only one of its kind in Canada, because the work hadn't been done by the previous government, and we needed to focus on that. But we know the crowded conditions in the long-term care homes, and those old ward rooms played a role in the infection spread. But without staff, where do you move people to? So, you know, I, I just appreciate all the people that have worked round the clock for the last year addressing these horrible, horrible shortcomings in long-term care. And we've been listening and addressing these issues. So do I take accountability for repairing this? Absolutely. That's why I came to politics. I didn't expect a pandemic, but my goodness, the duty, the obligation, the responsibility to stand and defend and to change this system, absolutely. That rests with me. And I'll continue to do that. Follow-up? Hey, Minister, I was actually uh, trying to find out what responsibility you take for the government's actual response during the pandemic. Because mm -hmm. uh, the auditor points out that it's not just, the, the just she points out all the systemic issues, but she also points out things about the inadequacy of the government's immediate response. So I'm asking you, what did your government um, fail to do adequately uh, in these, those initial months of the pandemic uh, that you're willing to take responsibility for? So, you know, 
I'm the Minister of Long-Term Care, and initially when we started, uh, um, we, we had um, the uh, inspections group and uh, a very small capital group that really hadn't uh, done a lot um, in, because only 611 beds were built from 2011 to 2018 under the previous government. So we were a, a, what I call a, an appendage ministry. Of a, so this was an integrated approach. So what, I'm, what I was responsible for uh, was making sure that, uh, that we um, engaged with the other, other members of an integrated response, the Ministry of Health, Minister of Labor and Training um, uh, and uh, Skills Development. Um, and we did eventually um, have input to the command table. But because this was anticipated to be led by the Ministry of Health, which it was, um, this was something that uh, we were uh, a, a part of, uh, but not fully integrated with. If you look at the recommendations by the Auditor General, and she acknowledges that. She talks about the importance of public health and the importance of identifying IPAC. So my role as Minister of Health uh, was to uh, look after increasing the capacity, addressing wait lists, making sure that we had a way forward to build capacity. Um, but, you know, all you have to do really is to look at the, uh, um, the divisions that we had um, as a beginning ministry. We had to build the ministry, um, and so we also had to integrate. So do I, what do I take responsibility for? I take responsibility for the well-being of, of residents in long-term care uh, and for, the, for accountability over fixing uh, the disaster of the last 15 years. That's what I'm accountable for, and that's what I'm trying to do. I, I am not. Uh, I'm not an acute care sector. I, uh, the public health is its own sphere, but we have to have a much better integrated system where long-term care is seen to be um, part of uh, the healthcare sector uh, as a whole, integrated with acute care and integrated with uh, public health, and all the the, the uh, groups that will allow a, a stronger pandemic response uh, going forward. Um, and, and better emergency preparedness. That's what I'm accountable for. Colin DeMello, City News. Uh, hi, Minister. Um, clearly your government should have learned something after the first wave, but I'm wondering um, how is it that more people died in long-term care during the second wave than during the first wave? Uh, how is it that your government didn't put out the fire, to use your analogy, didn't put out the fire between the first wave and the second wave, leading to even more deaths in the second wave than the first. Can you, can you walk us through how that happened? Yeah, thanks, Colin. So the first wave compared to the second wave compared to the third wave, they're all different. And I think if you have insight into uh, you know the issues in the first wave, uh, it was lack of PPE, it was testing issues, it was crowded uh, uh, old wardrooms, uh, and, and certainly the, um, the, the lack of understanding, even at the, the top uh, national levels, of whether masks would be beneficial or not. All of this uh, really points to you know, the, the scientific evolution of, of the understanding of COVID-19. So you know, you're looking at the, uh, the federal response, um, which comes down to the provinces, and then the, the chief medical officers of health and their associates then provide information down, down to the ministries. Uh, and so if you look at the first wave, very, very different context. Second wave, very large, um, uh, widespread community spread. Community spread really was the driver. Uh, and when you and we finally had the testing and the lab capacity to address that and to, to understand how much there was. We still had no vaccines. Uh, and uh, PPE was improved. So we had improved IPAC in the second wave. We had improved PPE. Uh, we had improved staffing. We were integrating uh, with public health and, um, and the, the acute care sector. And, uh, and as I said, hired 8,000, over 8,600 people in uh, to the long-term care sector by the second wave. Uh, but if you look at really uh, the issues in the second wave, it comes back to the long-term care homes being in the regions of high community spread. Very hard to keep it out. We were also starting to implement the surveillance testing and the, um, uh, through rapid testing as well. Uh, the initial surveillance testing started in April in the first wave, but we didn't have the rapid tests yet. So, you know, you have a, a, a disease that is spread by um, asymptomatic individuals. Some, some experts say up to half, half of the cases are spread with, uh, with asymptomatic. 
Um, and then you have controversy over um, aerosol spread. And the scientists are still, you know, um, discussing whether it's predominantly aerosol or not. So that would affect our IPAC measures. And so, you know, the COVID runs at COVID speed and the scientific understanding is trying to keep up, but I don't think we're there yet. And that's beyond my position. Um, and then in the third wave, uh, we're dealing with variants. Um, highly transmissible, um, much, um, uh, uh, you know, deadly, uh, deadlier, higher mortality, and um, the, uh, the inability to keep that out of our borders. And so the variants are coming in from, from other places. And, uh, you know, we've, we've seen up in Barrie what happens to long-term care when uh, a variant gets in. Um, the ability for those to spread quickly and cause devastating, devastating results. And that's what we're seeing in the, in the third wave. Um, the, the rapid escalation of the impact of those variants while our scientific experts discuss whether it's aerosol spread or not. And I think that's a really important part, that all three of these waves were different. There were lessons learned from each one and um, changes made. Um, but it's, it's, it's taking all the experts who still can't agree um, on, uh, on those sorts of things, a uh, global, uh, global pandemic where, where we're competing for resources, uh, and uh, all three were very different, but lessons learned in each one. Um, but many of it comes back to the old four-bed wardrooms, the staffing, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and appropriate infection prevention and control with proper scientific understanding. Minister, um, I'm going to ask a question on behalf of my colleague, Cynthia Mulligan, uh, who, who can't get on the line. She says, Minister, you warned of asymptomatic spread, and it seems the government ignored you. Clearly, there were issues in how the government handled COVID. The AG report said that the CMOH gave confusing direction. Homes were left on their own to handle infection control. The question is, you simply can't blame previous governments, or as you're doing at the podium here, blaming everyone, it seems, in Ontario but yourself. Um, to my colleague's point, are you willing to take any responsibility for the bad management of COVID-19? Well, I'm one person. This is an integrated response by many, many experts, much more expert than, than I am. Um, I have scientific understanding, but uh, I, uh, we, we rely on the experts like um, all the, the medical officers of health in public health, the advice from the uh, chief medical officer of health and the associate chief medical officer of health. Um, I don't think you would want a, a, a politician determining um, determining the, the public health measures. This is, this is done by the experts, and we have been listening to the public health experts this whole time. Um, so certainly, and I, I do take exception to your comment, I do take responsibility for this. This is why I'm still here. Um, uh, I, I have a scientific understanding and a background, and I'm a very caring and compassionate uh, a person who spent many years caring for the most vulnerable people in our society at their, 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 their worst time of need. Uh, and so that's, it is a duty. And we are in a war against COVID-19. And so, you know, uh, there's enough blame to go around uh, in many places. Um, I, am one, I am one person, and uh, I do take responsibility. And that's why I came to politics, because it seemed like nobody was doing anything about long-term care. And it's, it's, it's terrible. When we had runway, when we had the ability, like BC, to build the, the modernized facilities to, to address the staffing, it didn't happen. And that set the stage for this. So, you know, there are structural inadequacies, uh, inadequacies that are difficult to, to overcome overnight. But absolutely, our government has used every measure, uh, every tool. We've listened to the experts. Uh, but my point being is some of the experts can't even agree. So, you know, we are, we are left in a situation where uh, we're still learning. And there are many, many lessons to be learned here. This is a, a hundred year pandemic, a hundred years. Nobody's ever seen uh, a, a virus like this. Uh, aerosol, potential aerosol transmission, the asymptomatic spread. And countries around the world are, are dealing with this. And uh, Ontario's response, um, you know, I, I, my heart goes out to India, my heart goes out to Brazil, my heart goes out to all these countries that are badly suffering.